Center for Humanitarian Data on Quantifying Climate Change Risk and Humanitarian Response. Um, my name is Quinn. I'm with the OCHA Policy Branch, where we consider horizon issues and the strategic implications of new challenges uh, and trends for humanitarian action. Um, today, we're going to talk about the future impacts of climate change on the humanitarian crisis and discuss how can we can respond to them. Specifically, um, the Informed Climate Change Index will be presented, which for the first time quantifies how climate crisis risks will be affected by climate change. Uh, in addition, we'll look at how humanitarian organizations are using data and analysis for strategic and operational response to the humanitarian climate emergency. Just so everyone knows, this event is being recorded um, and we're really looking forward to, to having an at a later stage, um, some questions from the audience. Um, so please do put your questions into the chat for us. Just to give a little bit of context, um, as you all know, we've heard this a million times now that the climate crisis is a humanitarian crisis and it is unfolding now on humanitarian front lines around the world. Climate change is creating new hotspots for humanitarians. There are places where we will see increased demand, sadly. Um, and these crises are stretching us beyond our response systems. Uh, for example, recent research from OCHA and the IFRC highlighted the growing impacts of heat waves on humanitarian need. Our operational environment will change and become more complex over the coming decade. While climate change, conflict, economic, um, uh, economic crises, inequality, and pandemics are not new, these drivers are intensifying and making things more complicated, they're interacting and compounding in unpredictable ways um, with growing increases that we see will be irreversible. Our 2026 needs are set to far outpace our resources, uh, leaving us in, inundated um, and left unabated, the climate crisis will lead to humanitarian needs of unprecedented proportions. To reduce future need, we need to act early to contribute to longer term outcomes and that requires a bold shift in our mindset and approach. And this bold shift has to be supported by data and analysis um, that can help us to make decisions on how to help protect the people most at risk. Not just in anticipatory action, but in the next and months and years ahead. OCHA's new strategic plan identifies the strategic analysis of risk as a priority and analysis and data-driven decision-making as an enabler. This is the part, uh, this is in part the role of the Center for Humanitarian Data. With that, I'd like to uh, introduce our panelists today. Um, Tom DeGroote is the head of the DAP Disaster Management Unit at the Joint Research Center for the European Commission. Um, his unit provides specific support to the European Commission and international organizations in humanitarian response and disaster risk reduction. Uh, Tom was closely involved in the initial development of the INFORM project uh, for which JRC is the scientific lead. We also have with us Mark Skeef, um, a senior policy analyst at USAID um, based in the Bureau for uh, Policy Planning and Learning. Um, and Mark produces contextual analysis and the analytical products to inform USAID policy and budgetary formulation processes. Excuse me. Um, Annalena uh, Hoon is a regional anticipatory action and disaster, uh, disaster risk financing advisor for the UN World Food Program. Um, she is a regional bureau with the Regional Bureau for South Africa, and South Africa and Indian Ocean States. She's an environmental scientist and climate risk management practitioner currently overseeing WFP's uh, anticipatory action programming in South Africa. Um, I will first hand over to Tom uh, to go through his, his presentation and then we'll go to Mark and then Annalena and after that we'll have some uh, question and answer. Um, but over to you, Tom. Thanks a lot, Quinn, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone, depending on from where you are uh, joining us. Um, so, yes, I'm Tom de Groeve. I'm, I'm the head of unit at the Joint, Joint Research Center of the European Commission, which is a science center that advises uh, the, the commission, which is a political body of, of the European Union. 
And the European Union is the biggest donor of um, humanitarian aid, and that's why there is such a keen interest to use science and data to provide uh, a, a needs-based uh, intervention to humanitarian uh, aid, but also to anticipate what, uh, what the current or future needs uh, will be. So this is a very important element in, in the strategy of the European Union. And that's why we have been working on this for a long time together with um, within our organization, but also together with uh, many other partners. So today I will present uh, a new part of the project, which is the Inform Climate Change Index. Um, it's very important because it's really the first time we have some detailed uh, quantification of the impact of climate change on, on the future risk of humanitarian crisis. Uh, we all know that there will be more, more frequent and more intense uh, hazards around the world. Uh, that this is uh, said by the IPCC, and uh, it's it's really uh, coming out of science. Uh, the question is whether this will result in disasters. So can we cope with this? Um, uh, can we adapt uh, to this? Now, adaptation, the adaptation strategy is very important for the European uh, Union, for inside the Union, but also for uh, outside. There's a very big part of uh, outside of Europe, so there's a, a concern um, uh, re really around the humanitarian uh, impact of it. So it's expected that the new pattern of events will uh, occur uh, where countries with high vulnerability and low coping capacity will have more crisis. This will result in, in billions of additional humanitarian assistance and, and a setback really in sustainable development. So on this slide, you see um, the Inform products. Uh, we, we, have, we started about 10 years ago with a risk index, more or less for prevention and preparedness uh, of, of humanitarian action. Then work went on to develop a severity index to have kind of an objective way of comparing crises that are very difficult to compare, um, capturing the severity of evolving uh, a crisis and, and uh, mainly supporting response. Then very new is work on inform warning, uh, warning still in development for monitoring uh, early warning signals to, to support preparedness and early action. A few months ahead, uh, up to a year ahead, uh, what is coming, what will El Nino change, et cetera, these type of things. They're all designed to support decision-making at different phases of the crisis cycle. And, and very important is that all informed products follow the same principles, which you see on the top right. It has to be a global product open data, only open data as an input and as an output, the data is very open so everybody can integrate it in their own products. must be reliable, hence the uh, importance of a scientific organization behind it so that we try to apply the, the scientific methods um, and there's a lot of collaboration in this area too. And flexible so that it can be adapted by all of you in your own products, you can change it, you can modify it, you can use it uh, for your own integrated in your own processes. Uh, it's in, developed with many partners of, uh, that you see on the screen and there's always uh, room for more. And the importance of the partners is not only that they contribute it or use it, but really that the thinking goes in, that it, it becomes, it stays relevant for each of the partners and the expertise, the sectoral expertise gets into the product. The GRC is the scientific and technical lead of INFORM and OCHA uh, is, is the coordinator of, of the whole project. Next slide, please. Um, the Climate Change Index is actually an upgrade of the INFORM Risk Index. Here you see the INFORM Risk Index, which was developed in, in 2013. And at the time, it was a new way to measure risk uh, for humanitarian crisis and disasters that exceeds national capacity to respond. So the, we look ahead three to five years and that is what we call the, the risk. Since then it has become a global reference for the multi-hazard risk uh, assessment community. It's used by, by many and, and lots of organizations. 
Um, and it's based on a risk concept. A risk concept, risk is quite complicated, but through this, one of the achievements of INFORM is that one risk concept is being used by more and more organizations. So it's a shared risk assessment. It scores countries in five categories from very low risk to very high risk. And it uses 80 different indicators to measure hazards and, and people's exposure to them, but also vulnerability of, of the people and the coping capacity of the people and the government. And these are the dimensions you, you see on, on the screen. Next slide, please. Uh, inform climate change. Now, here you see it becomes complicated because it incorporates climate-related hazard projections, uh, but also demographic and other socioeconomic projections in the hazard, on, on the hazard side and on the exposure side, so that we can look at uh, the future risk. The projections are based on what you see on the top left, the so-called concentration pathways. So how how society, how, how the world will continue emitting or reducing uh, the emissions. And on the bottom left, you see the socioeconomic pathways um, introduced by the Intergovernmental Panel of, on Climate Change. So these are both kind of projections of how the world will look like in, in the future. And these are combined in, in scenarios. Um, informed Climate Change calculates the risk then based on these in 2050 and 2080. So we look ahead uh, using a set of plausible combinations of, of these factors. But to simplify it, we, we call it, uh, we, we, in the end, most of the results are presented in a pessimistic or an optimistic uh, scenario. And that's a bit what's explained on the slide here and that you will find in the background documentation, of course, uh, much more information on. In this way, we are able to expand the uncertainty because there is a lot of it. And then certainty in future risk uh, in, in a relatively uh, understandable way. The overall objective of the informed climate change is to develop a, a common evidence-based tool for uh, risk-informed uh, decision-making that can help unify the DRR community and, and the climate change adaptation community. The main results of all of this are, on the one hand, a change in risk, so how does climate changes the risk? And on the other hand, so the so-called vulnerability gap. Next slide, please. Here we see maps of both. Um, on the left, you see the change in risk. So if uh, the baseline is the risk today, then this map shows where risk will increase uh, or decrease. Um, it, plots the changes in the risk score relative to the baseline, and the largest changes in risk are projected in countries of West and Southern Africa, South America, and Western Asia. On the right, you see the vulnerability gap, which shows the change in vulnerability and coping capacity that would be required to maintain the baseline level of risk. The large increases in vulnerability gap experiences uh, is experienced in countries in Africa, in South America, and Western Asia. There are countries with the same change in risk, but a different vulnerability gap. The higher the vulnerability gap, the more countries should invest in adaptation measures to maintain the current level of risks. Otherwise, the risk for humanitarian crisis will increase, and with that also the humanitarian assistance needs will probably increase. It's also an interesting measure, this vulnerability gap, because it can be correlated with um, uh, the, the need, the contributions for adaptation efforts. Uh, so the need for adaptation efforts in, in these areas. Next slide, please. We can say that globally, we face significant increases in the risk of crisis as a result of climate change. And this is true regardless of the emissions and demographic scenarios used. So even in the optimistic scenario, there's an increase. 
But taking the pessimistic scenario by 2050, we are looking at an increase of 45% in the number of countries classified as having a, a high or very high risk. From 36 countries now to 52 countries in 2050. The number of people living in just those very high risk countries will be 1.5 billion. That is almost triple the number of today. For context today, every country classified as very high risk has currently a UN humanitarian appeal. So you can imagine them for the future. So do 60% of the high risk countries. So without action to reduce these risks, we are facing significant increases in both the scope of crisis and, and their scale. Next slide, please. Of course, these increases in risk do not apply equally uh, to all the countries. The crisis risk will increase in all regions, but some are much harder hit uh, than others. The biggest increases of risk are in Africa. You see this on this plot, specifically Western, Southern and Eastern Africa. Uh, there are also large increases in Central and South America, Western and Central Asia, and Micronesia. Next slide, please. Again, increases in risk will not affect countries equally in terms of income group, which you see here. Lower and lower middle income countries will be worse affected. They face not only the biggest increases in risk, but also the biggest vulnerability gap. This is where most resources will be needed to reduce the risk. Without increased efforts to reduce the vulnerability, these countries will probably not be able to cope with the increasing risk. Next slide, please. Droughts are a major driver of increased risks. Fine. So we can look at the different drivers uh, of this risk. Um, we're not able to make these projections for all causes. And like any project and like any indicator-based system, there are limitations. But here, for instance, we did consider droughts and it comes out really as the most important driver of, uh, of increased crisis risk. By 2050, more than 1.6 billion people four times the ones of today, would be exposed to severe and extreme droughts. That will include more than 20% of the African population. More than 300 million people will be exposed annually to river floods, which is double the number of today, and more than 70 million to coastal floods. Again, more than double today. There will also be large increases in exposure to malaria and dengue. Uh, one of the useful outputs of informed climate change is that it can tell us the relative importance of these drivers in every country. And that can help with adaptation planning. Next slide, please. Inform climate change, no, the previous slide, yes. Uh, inform climate change offers the deep dive into quantified impacts of climate and socioeconomic trends of risks of the future, risks of future humanitarian crisis and disasters. We've seen, unfortunately, that increases in risk and resulting crisis impacts are guaranteed, and even in the optimistic scenario there will be. These occur under both pessimistic and optimistic scenarios. However, there is quite a range between these scenarios. So the good news is that we can still limit the increases in risk. For example, the number of people living in high and very high risk countries will almost double under the pessimistic scenario, but increases only by 35% under the optimistic scenario. So another major uh, conclusion from this work is that we can still make a huge difference to the future crisis risk through action on emissions, adaptation measures, and sustainable development. And specifically in building crisis resilience, also in high-risk countries. So informed climate change 
helps make informed climate change policy choices in the end. And that's the final uh, message of my talk. So next slide, I, I would like to, well, thank you for your attention, but also thank all the par partners in INFORM that make this possible. Um, you saw them on the beginning, but especially on the scientific side. So this is um, uh, the Joint Research Center, but also very much the CMCC organization in Italy with whom we have collaborated very closely to make this work. And all the information you can find in this link, uh, it's a long link, but I hope it will be shared to, to all of you where you can find uh, the data, the products and the explanations of the tool. With this, I conclude. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, that's that's it, it's it's fascinating, and we're getting a lot of questions, but we'll save that to the end, of course. But um, now that we've heard from Tom about quantifying risks, um, I'm going to hand over to Mark, who's going to talk about how we incorporate those climate risks into humanitarian planning. O over to you, Mark. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, just to provide a bit more background on my role at USAID, uh, I'm an analyst based in our Central uh, Policy and Planning Bureau uh, in Washington, and I conduct exploratory contextual analysis on sort of the range of sectors that uh, USAID operates in, both uh, developmentally and humanitarian uh, portfolio related, uh, so really spanning the full breadth of USAID's portfolio. And uh, our analyses um, sort of are aimed to inform uh, everything from like high level policy formulation and budgetary processes all the way down to country strategy development and, and even program design out in the field at our missions worldwide. Uh, so I'm inherently a, a generalist, uh, not a climate specialist or humanitarian professional, although I, I did once serve as an info officer in our humanitarian bureau. So I will always have a fond place in my heart for OCHA sit reps. Nothing like a good old OCHA sit rep. Um, <laughs> Uh, I do in my current role, though, analyze uh, climate and humanitarian issues as part of the analyses that our team prepares uh, for stakeholders across USAID, especially non-humanitarian stakeholders that want to understand humanitarian issues. And I often draw on informed tools in that regard. <clears throat> um, so I should start on this topic by, by noting that climate change is a, is a top priority for USAID. Uh, our administrator, uh, Samantha Power, has called on our agency to consider ourselves a climate agency uh, and has mobilized an all-hands-on-deck approach uh, to our efforts to counter the, 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 crisis, the climate crisis. Uh, a, a key recent development in that regard uh, is the launch of USAID's new climate strategy uh, last year. And a fundamental tenet of that strategy is an acknowledgement that climate change really affects everything that USAID does. Uh, every sector and field office and all of our partners have a role to play in that as we confront the crisis. And it implicates all of our programming, almost all of our programming worldwide. And so the strategy calls on all corners of USA to play a part in this whole of agency approach. Uh, and, and the strategy is centered on six high level uh, ambitious targets that are shown at right here on this slide uh, for achievement by 2030. Uh, the strategy contains several requirements to help USA to ramp up implementation uh, of the strategy, including a call for each of our roughly 80 field missions to, uh, to revisit and, and revise their climate annexes of their country strategies. Uh, to, to basically identify and articulate programmatic priorities for contributing to this new climate strategy. Uh, and also for each USAID uh, Washington-based bureau to develop, to develop climate action plans to basically map out how each bureau will contribute to these uh, high-level targets and how they will align to the strategy. Um, USAID, like of course, has a long history of programming uh, aimed at climate risks. Uh, typically in recent years, it's been centered on adaptation and two areas of mitigation, namely clean energy and sustainable landscapes, uh, and also our humanitarian bureaus, uh, early recovery and risk reduction and resilience programs, uh, and some of our support to climate uh, info services and early warning resources, things like uh, Servier and Inform, uh, and USAID's climate risk profiles, uh, which you can Google and check out. They're they're quite useful. And this sort of climate specific or climate explicit programming. Uh, has typically totaled somewhere in the rough ballpark of 1 to 1.5 billion uh, US dollars annually in terms of uh, funding. Although I should note over the last six, six years alone, uh, USAID has mobil mobilized roughly 38 billion in climate finance from public and private sources uh, toward programs to which we've contributed. 
Um, but this new strategy, however, is, is really calling for a far more extensive approach, uh, a far more proactive mainstreaming of climate considerations across our, our conventional development and humanitarian programming uh, at an agency where our budget last year exceeded $40 billion. So the implications of the strategy and this climate mainstreaming are huge. And I say all this um, relating to the inform tool uh, because the strategy is calling on all USAID staff, uh, many of whom do not have a background in climate issues, to determine how climate change considerations should be integrated into their programming. Uh, some of their programming that has um, been existing and evolving form for the last 15, 20 years, and to really call new questions uh, for people that don't have a climate background in terms of the implications of climate risk for what they're doing. Uh, and prior to the strategy release, almost all USAID programs were already screened for climate risk, but, but this is really calling for a completely different order of magnitude of climate mainstreaming. And it's also calling on leadership and decision makers uh, in, in Washington mainly uh, to approach our agency-wide strategic planning with this sort of long range uh, climate anticipatory action squarely in mind, a very futurist approach uh, to strategic planning. Uh, next slide, please. So in, in the context of this climate mainstreaming at USAID, uh, I, I find tools like Inform to be really helpful for providing uh, an evidence-based center of gravity uh, and, and a really accessible layperson's view into climate risks uh, in a systematic cross-country comparable fashion. The cross-country comparability is really key to it, and there's, there's so much that goes into the methodology to, to allow that to happen. And like any cross-country index, there are, there are inherent challenges in that. But I really applaud the informed team for all the thoughtful work they've done in that regard. And I also, of course, welcome the new climate change uh, tool and their suite of tools because it allows you to see how these risks evolve over the different emissions and socioeconomic pathway scenarios and across different time horizons uh, to really build in that climate view into a humanitarian risk. <clears throat> and I don't know, uh, many of you may not be familiar with, with USAID, but, but in, in the reality of a bilateral donor like USAID, we, we program across so many different sectors. Our, our programmatic decision making is fairly decentralized out to the field, uh, and our, our U.S. Foreign Service staff are cycling from mission to mission every every year, every two years. It's very hard to have a continuity of planning. So having having a common touchstone and a unifying conceptual framework uh, like that offered by Inform uh, can be really helpful for that continuity of planning. Uh, it's particularly helpful, important right now in the climate space where we're seeing a proliferation of, of data resources and everyone's sort of approaching climate risk from a different definitional foundation, different vantage point. Uh, what we really need is a common framework and a common approach upon which uh, stakeholders can plan jointly around all of these issues. Sort of like what we have right now in the food security space with the IPC classification system. Um, we really need something like that in the climate space. And I've personally found informs dichotomy of hazards on one hand and, and the vulnerability and coma capacities on the other hand to be a really helpful sort of lens or rubric for delving into disaster risk. When looking back to the climate strategy six targets that I had mentioned in the prior slide, uh, the informed climate change tool is, is you know, primarily helpful when taking a global corporate view into adaptation needs, uh, when planning out our, our adaptation priorities, uh, with that cross-country comparability being obviously really critical because those apples to apples comparisons uh, that inform offers across different hazards and circumstances really allows us to take that corporate view uh, to planning. <clears throat> another, another way in which inform tools uh, are useful, I think, uh, is uh, at, at a donor like USAID is in fostering interaction between our development focused and humanitarian focused staff, considering it spans both worlds. Uh, I, I would say that inform is a pretty a pretty rare example of a data resource that both our development and humanitarian stakeholders both use as part of the core work. Uh, the Venn diagram is, is, is not as overlapping as I wish it was between our development and humanitarian staff. And I think um, common tools and joint analysis really helps break down those silos. Um, I know our humanitarian colleagues in our Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance use INFORM as part of their core work uh, and in their analytical dashboards. And, and my team uh, and others like our climate mitigation, or sorry, conflict mitigation specialists or people in our food security bureau, uh, they're also using Inform as well. So it's sort of like a common touch point uh, between our development and humanitarian staff. Um, I, I've also found these types of tools like Inform uh, to be uh, really helpful in our climate related coordination with our interagency colleagues in the US government, uh, which is really critical for USAID to fulfill its mandate. Um, I've seen Inform and similar tools like Notre Dame's GAIN Index 
uh, which is also useful in its own way. It's not a, not not a they, they both can sort of contribute in their own ways. Um, I've been I've seen both used in USA's annual budget processes, and we, we have these uh, sector roundtables that convene dozens of U.S. agencies um, that all do foreign assistance, and so it provides like sort of an evidence-based foundation for that. And, and the other agencies look to USAID to like to show them what you know what is the strongest evidence in in development areas or humanitarian areas. So it's helpful in that regard. <clears throat> Going back to the strategy, um, interagency coordination on climate in the U.S. government has been really substantial recently. That, that strategy is aligned to broader U.S. government efforts to tackle the climate crisis, uh, including the president's emergency plan for adaptation and resilience, uh, or PREPARE. Uh, you got to love a good, a good acronym. They came up with a good one there. Uh, and the Global uh, Climate Ambition Initiative. And these types of analytics like inform are a big part of the targeting that underlies uh, that PREPARE initiative. Uh, and actually, one of its three core pillars is centered on the notion that information is power in the climate space. Uh, and it calls for support to applied research and climate info services and their use uh, with the ultimate goal of making uh, better climate smart decisions. <clears throat> some, some specifics on the USAID side underneath that prepare initiative our, our Bureau for humanitarian initiative is uh, sorry Bureau for humanitarian assistance is embarking on an early warning for all partnership with uh, with NOAA and with the world meteorological organization uh, to help uh, nations um, mitigate risk risk related, related to weather. Uh, by strengthening early warning capacities of national hydrometeorological service providers for early action. Also, um, our, our Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance launched a new $200 million climate smart and disaster ready uh, annual program statement uh, where they will work with local partners to identify and implement uh, clim climate adaptation solutions with communities at the greatest risk of climate related disasters. And that, that really represents a fundamentally um, a new sort of area of intervention. Uh, for our humanitarian bureau that that is really exciting and there's, there's enormous potential and I, i'm not sure what, what the future will bring but it likely will just get larger and larger um that that type of work at our agency um i think just a couple of closing thoughts um you know anticipatory action uh in the in the, in the humanitarian space or early warning tours or early warning tools are really critical like that um you know the challenge of mobilizing climate adaptation programming Based on forecasts that span decades is a whole is a whole other story, especially uh, when the forecasts come with wide margins of error. Um, you know, and many of the most severe development impacts are still decades away, uh, but will we'll still almost definitely be very real. And I think the Inform tool really helps bring a tangibility to it uh, for people to really center their planning around that that is really invaluable. Um, one, one challenge in this analytical space that I've found is there's a real dearth of cross country comparable data on climate adaptation institutional capacity or readiness. It seems like a really big blind spot to me uh, in, the glo in global climate planning. Um, and so I'm always on lookout for resources there in terms of like a globally comparable uh, resource in that regard. Um, it's definitely a challenging and complex space and we're, we're really grateful at USAID for tools like Inform and the broader work in partnership with the climate community, including all, all, all of you here today. Uh, so I'll just wrap things up by saying thank you to the Inform team for all the great work, uh, and I'll hand things back over to the facilitator. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, that's excellent, and I think the insight that you gave into how a donor is using this information is is is, is really fantastic. Um, with that, I will hand over to Annalena, who will take us more now through a context specific example of um, of. of climate change and anticipatory action in the Southern Africa region. Over to you, Annalena. Thanks, Gwen. And first of all, to applaud Mark uh, representing USAID and with the back donor community who are increasingly um, ready to invest in also more innovative approaches such as anticipatory action. Uh, very appreciative of, of that as humanitarian organization. Um, so indeed, as Quinn has said, I will approach the topic more from an operational angle. I'm a regional advisor looking into anticipatory action, wider dis disaster risk financing with the United Nations World Food Program. So I'm based in Johannesburg and I support the Southern Africa uh, region and Indian Ocean states in adopting maybe a more uh, proactive anticipatory approach to uh, disaster and climate risk management. So. Um, today, I'll reflect a bit on uh, the implications of climate change on our, our ongoing portfolio of anticipatory action and wider climate action in the Southern Africa region. 
as we've heard from Tom earlier in the session, um, Southern Africa is um, one of the, um, yeah, predicted to be the most um, heavily affected by climate change um, using the, the novel informed climate change risk index. So these reflections are very timely and necessary to inform future programming. Next slide, please. As a brief introduction um, to anticipatory action for those of you that have not uh, had any contact with the approach um, and the implementation as of yet. So essentially with anticipatory action, we uh, wish to close a gap that we identified in the disaster risk management cycle. We as in WFP, but the wider community of practice, other humanitarian agencies are embarking on this as well, uh, including OCHA, but also um, the Red Cross and Repression community, um, FAO and so forth. So what we noticed was that we were quite good and operationally sound to respond to disasters uh, after impact. So conventional emergency response uh, leading into recovery. We became better at um, supporting annual um, yeah, emergency preparedness, readiness to response activities and longer term programming of disaster risk reduction and resilience building. But we didn't have any mechanisms or tools in place that would allow us to access humanitarian funding. Uh, based on um, the evidence and information of an imminent risk, uh, so essentially forecast information, early warnings of an approaching climate uh, shock, be it floods, cyclones, droughts, um, and reach at risk population groups uh, before it actually comes to um, disaster impact. So with anticipatory action, we essentially try to build systems um, based on forecast information. We set risk thresholds and triggers um, that then automatically disperse anticipatory humanitarian finance and activate um, mitigatory actions on the ground, reaching communities ahead of impact. Next slide. So anticipatory action forms part of a more holistic climate action portfolio that WFP supports that is designed to kind of follow our core mandate responsibilities, um, aiming to achieve climate resilience towards zero hunger, but also in a wider sense supporting um, SDGs 13 climate action and 17 partnerships for the goals. And it really spans the humanitarian and development nexus. Um, that's why um, analytical tools essentially, as Mark has mentioned, that span the nexus and can um, be of value and service to both sides of the spectrum are, uh, are really of, of key importance um, at this stage. On the saving lives uh, side, we would support um, activations such as really delivering um, anticipatory actions on the ground ahead of the impact of a climate shock, the dissemination of last mile early warning messages, um, but we also work hand in hand with governments to enable and build sustainable government led systems, strengthen early warning systems, enhance climate services, forecasting capabilities and so forth, um, access to climate risk insurance, um, adaptive social protection, and then, um, yeah, also enabling nature-based solutions. Next slide. So this is our current programming portfolio in Southern Africa, um, following kind of the, the overarching narrative of wanting to restore degraded landscapes and ecosystems, anticipating the impact of climate shocks through systems and tools such as anticipatory action, protecting lives and livelihoods also through early uh, response tools such as uh, macro insurance, macro insurance, um, energize. Um, we, we promote the use of sustainable and clean energy uh, solutions for at-risk communities and governments um, in the region. And that all um, through um, an approach to really enhance climate resilience of people, but also government systems and related tools. Um, so really an integrated package of, of um, of climate risk management. Um, you will see in the next slide where I uh, give an overview of the um, INFORM climate change uh, risk index that indeed the Southern Africa region is projected to um, be severely impacted by climate change and we will see a increase um, of climate change risk in the region. So most of the countries rank in the moderate high to very high risk increase categories, only Botswana ranking as low. Um, but beyond that, really looking at vulnerabilities from our core mandate, essentially very much interested in how climate change will impact on food systems, on um, food and nutrition security and livelihoods in the region, 
we expect a very severe in impact on top of that on, on uh, what are largely climate vulnerable food systems um, and livelihoods. So 90% of agro agricultural production in the region um, is sourced from, from um, a subsistence farming um, and 30% of that at minimum is projected to be at risk of climate change impact. So we need to understand as an organization what implications that will have on uh, livelihoods that largely depend um, on smallholder farming. Um, beyond that, climate change impacts are already impacting on the region. So we see an increased frequency and intensity of climate, uh, climate stressors and climate shocks, um, uh, increased heat stress, uh, cyclones, droughts and floods. Um, and those shocks really affect food security along the, the four core pillars. Um, impacting on the availability, access, use, and stability of food, um, nutritious food supply, essentially, and security. Also, we see that climate change acts as risk multiplier, and we really see um, a correlation between climate and, um, and the water, energy, and food nexus, essentially. So all of these interlinkages and compounding vulnerabilities we need to, to understand um, and, and inform our programming with. Next slide. Now, Mark, you've touched a bit on it, um, and I actually had really interesting discussions with our in-house experts, but also scientists we work with in um, international research institutes, uh, such as IRI Institute of Columbia University, who support the forecasting elements of our anticipatory action programming. Um, so reflection on what the likely impact of climate change will be on the predictability of climate shock. So essentially what impact we are foreseeing um, of climate change on the accuracy uh, and the skill of the forecasts we build our anticipatory action programs on. And we sort of reached consensus that um, that will really um, be determined by key factors. Uh, first of all, where we're trying to predict these climate shocks, so the geographical location, but also what the, the application, humanitarian ap application of the forecast um, would be that it is informing, be it uh, longer term. Um, climate resilience programming or indeed um, shorter term anticipatory action activations ahead of a shock or to inform readiness for response. And then also the type of forecasts we're, we're using. Um, so short range for forecast, um, so essentially uh, um, predicting extreme weather um, with a lead time of days, we're expecting to maintain um, in, in decent predictability, which is great news for all our anticipatory action work that goes um, focuses on floods, cyclones, dry spells, and so forth, um, more sudden onset shocks. Um, with regards to seasonal and subseasonal forecasting, um, there we see is still some uncertainty on how climate change will likely impact on the predictability, um, and that will have potential implications on how we design uh, drought anticipatory action systems and the forecasts um, that, that we base the systems on and the indicators we use. Um, and obviously, we need to understand um, uh, the specific vulnerability and risk factors in, in the region we operate um, to produce region, regional specific forecasts, essentially. The bottom line is, though, um, on the positive uh, side, that our forecasting capabilities and the systems that support uh, forecasts are improving significantly over time. Um, so we expect that potential decrease in accuracy of our predictions would be likely counterbalanced by um, the increase in, in, in skill of these systems um, and forecasts. Next slide. Now, last thought on climate change implications on our WFP operations in the field of climate action that I've presented. So essentially the impact on our ongoing portfolio of integrated climate risk management. Uh, we do see an increased urgency of adopting a um, layered and a sequenced approach to climate risk management and opting for a combination of different interventions ranging from longer term climate change adaptation, um, climate resilience building initiatives, um, and pairing them with more shorter term interventions, such as anticipatory action to buffer essentially resilience gains and development gains um, from increased uh, frequency and magnitude of climate shocks that we're uh, expecting with, with climate change, opting for no regret and flexible approaches. And for that, it's really key that we have also back a donor community that is um, kind of uh, has a risk appetite to essentially allow us to do that, to, to opt for these flexible approaches such as anticipatory action, 
and, and using forecast information to act ahead of time, um, protect live and, lives and livelihoods. And we further need to increase the understanding of local realities. So we do see um, immense uh, relevance of uh, in the indices such as the, the informed climate change risk index. Um, it allows, as was said before, for cross-border, cross-country comparison, but then we do need to, to inform our operations, we need to understand um, locally specific realities and impacts. So building on the inform index to add um, our, our agency specific analyses on top of that. Uh, again, also specific to our sector specific needs, focusing on food security, uh, food systems, um, livelihoods. And then uh, really need to further understand climate change impact on the predictability of climate shocks as forecasts are really the, the base of our forecast based interventions. Um, this understanding will be of key. So I think more analysis will need to feed into, into that. Over to you, Kim. Thanks very much for that. Um, excellent example of sort of the, the, the both context and operational uh, use of, of, of this, this data and analysis. Um, so thank you everyone for, for uh, asking questions and we're really getting questions from all over the world. So that's really fantastic. Um, but let me start with uh, Tom, if that's all right. Um, Tom, now that we've heard about how important this data and analysis is for, for planning and programming, um, what you know, one of the questions that we have here is how do we deal with data quality issues um, and, and what are the gaps um, you see in terms of, of data um, that that's out there? Um, and related to that, you know, how do you think inform can be updated and improved in the future? Uh, good, thanks. Indeed, the um, data is often the limiting factor for much of these more global products where You've seen for the risk index, it's 80 indicators. So there's kind of an expectation that in all 80 indicators, you would have updated values for all countries every year. You now, because you you if you, you monitor the risk, but this is not the case. Of course, some indicators, like I I, I don't know now by heart, but, but perhaps um, gender inequality is only updated every five years or something, and 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 the GDP yes is updated every year. But it, it, there's a variety of, of this in there, of course. And the good thing is there's always new data. There's more data is, is uh, more and more available. There's more capacity to, to, to collect it, to analyze it, to generate it also from new sources, be it remote sensing, be it social media analysis, be it um, artificial intelligence approaches, I don't know. So there's always new data that can uh, potentially be used in this. And this is uh, some of the, the core issues that we, of course, address from, from the more scientific side, uh, always looking out for uh, what kind of data could we use to describe a phenomenon that perhaps one of the partners would like to have in the index. Now, can we not also consider this aspect? And then we look for it. So it's it's in constant evolution. And perhaps I want to make a side note here too, because I saw there was a question on subnational. On subnational, of of course, this would be very useful at subnational level. At at global level per country, it is indeed useful for global programming, for global comparison, for the the big picture. But uh, it's less useful to apply it uh, for analysis in countries. For that, you need subnational data by province, by even, and even go further and further down the ground. But this is always a different project because, like you say, it's about the data. Then you need all these data broken down by province. You need it broken down by by sector, by province, etc. Theoretically, it's all possible, and uh, perhaps you know that Inform on, on the risk side does a lot of subnational work, and this is supported by organizations, by UNDP and by a fundlet and by, by uh, partners that do actually the work. It's very important because it brings you closer to the DRR world, no? to the disaster risk reduction world. You can make it concrete and you can actually turn it into in, in action plans and all. The same on climate, this could be done. It is not done for the future because the data uh, work is quite significant to do this. 
but of course this could be looked at in the future. We are a partnership with many partners, so perhaps there's capacity out there that uh, could look into this. Fantastic, thanks. I'm conscious of the time, um, and I just want to get through as many questions as possible. Um, Mark, uh, we have a question for you. In terms of from the donor perspective, um, what do you think are the most important uh, gaps and challenges in terms of data-driven decision-making um, around the climate change impacts that we're talking about? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that's um, that's a great question. It's it's sort of like uh, the question that keeps me going every day in terms of uh, if, it, if it was easy, anyone could do it, or it, it, it's definitely, um, I mean, that, that, that's, a, that's a question and challenge that applies across development sectors. Um, mm -hmm. It's particularly challenging in the climate space because climate is such a cross-cutting space, uh, and, and, and I'll clarify like, how that plays out in terms of like practical challenges. I've already mentioned one, one gap uh, I, I saw. For USAID, we do a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of um, institutional capacity support. Um, you know, we're, we're very, we're very interested in, um, in, in partner governments being, you know, delivering uh, adequate basic services to their populations and, um, you know, fostering the sort of social contract. And um, in the climate space, you know, we don't really have a great measurement of um, the sort of adip climate adaptation uh, institutional readiness or capacity of partner governments. Inform uses the best thing that's out there right now uh, in that regard, right? They use the Hyogo self self assessment frameworks, which are which are really useful. Um, ultimately, they are they're sort sort of self assessment frameworks, though, and they're 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 ultimately uh, most useful for individual governments tracking their progress over time. <clears throat> um, but you know, the challenge of that type of measurement would be trying to assess. Like, it involves so many different line ministries and so many different stakeholders within each country system. Um, that, you know, it would be a, quite a resource intensive endeavor to try to, to develop a new resource like that. But I think that's one, that's one area where I see a, a gap. I think another area, um, an, an area that's sort of becoming less and less of a problem over time, but there has generally been a, a real dearth of rigorous evaluation work in the climate resilience and adaptation space. Um, particularly um, evaluations that are like externally valid or externally generalizable. Because uh, you know the, the 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 adaptation interventions themselves are so context specific that the climate risks are so context specific that it sort of then follows that the evaluations also are very context specific, um, and there's there's a real short shortfall of generalizable evaluation findings in the climate space. But I think you're seeing more and more of it over time. Um, but you know I I think like you know having dedicated evaluation resources built into our climate programming is really critical um, to, to sort of building that up. And I think that's very much something that that, that is the donor's responsibilities uh, to, to, to do that. And I think USAID is in, every year, you know, we make progress in that regard in terms of the amount of money that we dedicate toward those program evaluations. I think another big um, evidence gap or, or danger is is in missing the uh, the you know, climate needs or priorities of marginalized populations in the countries where we work. Women, youth are two uh, really, really large populations that, that that matter a lot in this regard and other marginalized populations. It, it's a huge focus of our new climate strategy. Um, it's, a, it's a whole, you know, it's one, of, it's one of the six objectives. And I think, um, you know, the marginalized populations are often not only likely to be most impacted by climate, but also, um, um, very involved in some of the most influential actions to mitigate climate risks. So really um, building into our programs and into our evaluations, ensuring that we're capturing uh, their need, that their, mm -hmm. their objectives and, the, and their needs and whether those needs and voices are, are heard or met. I think that's another a big one. I think in terms of like the use of data uh, in general in this space, um, I think like inherently you have um, when you're when you're talking about planning for things that are decades out, it's just inherently involving um, a need to embrace uncertainty uh, and to be flexible that um, we see more and more of this sort of foresight like work. I'm sure uh, many of you have heard of like foresight units popping up at different agencies and different agencies grappling with how to embrace and plan for risks that are decades away. Mm -hmm. And climate is like the perfect example of that, but it's not the only example of that. And I think it. It really, it really um, 
necessitates embracing an, a level of uncertainty that it's almost gets into like human psychology, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I think, you know, at USAID, I see more and more of an appetite for that and people being, you know, slowly more and more comfortable doing real action uh, based on projections that are far out and that have uncertainty associated with them as the climate threat gets more and more real for all of us. So I think that's like another inherent challenge. It's not an evidence gap, but just a challenge of using uh, of these types of data in the climate space. Right. I'll stop there and let, let you uh, go to the next question. Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and I think it, it actually leads well to the next question, which is uh, for Annalena. Um, you know, you know, Mark has just mentioned all these different vulnerable groups and, um, you know, so many facets of this, this, this data and analysis. Um, and one of the questions for you, Annalena, is, you know, how far has the humanitarian community come in making partnerships on data and analysis, right? Because this is such a, a, a challenging um, uh, field to, to be analyzed given all of the, the drivers of need um, and the vulnerable groups. Um, you know, how are partnerships going on data analysis and where can we improve those partnerships? Yeah, thanks, Ken. Um, I think there has been um, quite a lot of improvement uh, in terms of data and data sharing for oper operational purposes harmonized assessments and so forth. I think actors such as the OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data or platforms such as Humanitarian Data Exchange HDX are really key in enabling that. So kind of uh, creating spaces where that exchange uh, can happen and creating entities that have that sort of as, as part of their core mandate is key. So I think in general has been improving. I think um, some limiting factors were at times at national level, the nature of the context or uh, protection risks and sharing data that was collected by certain uh, agencies or sharing uh, essentially also raw data uh, across agencies with personal information. I think that was one inhibiting factor, but I think the willingness to coordinate across uh, actors has really improved. Um, now, maybe moving more precisely into anticipatory action um, programming, with, which also has uh, quite quite huge uh, data needs. Um, we did realize in the region that there was quite some silo implementation by different agencies supporting anticipatory action programming, siloed implementation of different methodologies and use of different um, data sets and forming vulnerability la layers, uh, which were paired with forecasts and so forth. Um, so we decided um, to, to establish a regional um, coordination platform, uh, the Regional Anticipatory Action Working Group, which is chaired by um, FAO, IFRC, and WFP for Southern Africa, in which that harmonization and alignment of data usage, data access, data sharing takes place. Um, so I think coordination platforms help uh, there as well, next to just having um, yeah, entities that, that, that supervise that process and Kind of enable that process as part of their core mandate. Over. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for keeping us to time. Um, with that, uh, with a minute left, I want to thank the panelists and all the participants today who've really you know, come in across the globe. Um, clearly, there are many areas where the humanitarian system needs to adapt to the climate emergency, um, not least around anticipatory action, as, as Annalena has, has mentioned, but also around financing and factoring climate risk into longer term strategies and programming. So really uh, very much to do with what Mark was mentioning on supporting resilience, um, you know, and, and through social protection programs, especially for those vulnerable groups, uh, livelihoods and, and basic service uh, programming. Um, but our main focus here today was on data and analysis, and it seems that we can identify some very important points already. Um, one is that uh, there are critical research and data gaps um, that we need to, to address so that we can better understand, plan, and program around climate risk. Um, and I think, again, this is something that both, that all the panelists mentioned, but it's uniting agencies, governments, local communities, and other partners around that integrated risk analysis based on scientific projections, um, you know, that where we will see increased climate risks and resulting needs. Um, and this is really where INFORM, I think we've heard, is, is been really valuable. Um, and we need more tools like INFORM so that we can do collective planning um, and, and programming. Um, and we need to further strengthen our analysis to really support a shift towards anticipatory action and financing and longer term action. 
um, you know, not just the sort of the annual humanitarian program cycle, but something that's looking at this over over time so that we're really building community resilience. Um, and that's really the main lesson is that analysis can look several years into the future. Um, and that's what we need to adequately prepare and mitigate uh, for future climate change impacts. Um, again, thank you to the panelists. Thank you to the audience today for the questions um, and thank you to the, um, the Center for Humanitarian Data for organizing this today. Bye everybody. Bye-bye.